three straight goals for the Vancouver Canucks, and they take down one of the better teams in the NHL, the Nashville Predators, to finish their road trip against really the gauntlet, right? We're talking about five of the hardest teams to play against in the NHL in Florida, Tampa, Carolina, Washington, and Nashville. And they pull four points out of it, which doesn't sound that great. But when you look at the way they played over these five games, and we'll get to that a little bit later, uh, I think, honestly, that is a pretty successful trip as the Canucks get back to the 500 mark. Elias Pettersson is looking a little bit Elias Pettersson-y. Uh, and overall, another pretty solid game from the Vancouver squadron. So let's go over uh, this entire game as we do the recap. We'll get into my thoughts of the game afterwards and then your takes, your opinions, all that good stuff. If you want to start getting your questions in now, you absolutely can. I will scroll back to the top and read through. So this is your chance uh, to get those through. It's Thatcher Demko in for the Canucks. David Riddich in for the Preds. Uh, Predators on a back-to-back. -back, so the Canucks get the backup goalie treatment. Uh, Bo Horvat out with COVID protocol. Uh, so he's going to be stuck in the States for a while, which is unfortunate. Uh, the first period, not a lot happens. Canucks get a couple of unsuccessful power plays, but a pretty good road period coming out of it 0-0 against a pretty solid team. I think you're pretty okay with that. The shots were 9-7. The second period where things start to pick up. Brock Besser goes to the box in an early tripping penalty, and the Canucks have really struggled on the penalty kill during this road trip, and it's Philly Tom uh, Philip Tomasino uh, scoring. Uh, it's another goal in the penalty kill. Uh, Demko probably wants this one back, sort of snuck through him uh, when he probably should have saved. But hey, it's the only goal he gave up tonight, so I'm not going to complain too much. Uh, about a minute later, I think Trennan, is, his name is, I had never heard of him before. He had a wide open net and missed it. Um, a few minutes after that, Thatcher Demko, beautiful send pass uh, all the way up the ice to Niels Hoaglander. He springs Vasily Podkolzin on a breakaway, uh, and Podkolzin tries to go to the backhand. It's a good save from Riddick, but... I mean, what is he going to do? The puck just uh, falls into the slot right in front of the net. Elias Pettersson is there. Riddich is off to the side of the net. Pettersson bangs it in. Uh, three goals in the last two games for Elias Pettersson, getting his seventh, eighth, and ninth. One third of his goals this season have come in the last two games. Uh, makes no mistake on that one. We're tied at one. Uh, on the next shift, the same trio sort of dominates for two minutes. Uh, that that Pedersen, Hoaglander, Pod Colson line. They they basically were double shifting them. They they had that one shift where pa, uh, Pedersen scores. Then there's there's there was a commercial break, and then they send them right back out after. Uh, they dominate. They have about two minutes straight of offensive zone possession. Pedersen puts them off the bar. Uh, they take another shift, like uh, just a minute after that, and again dominate possession in the line in between that. The JT Miller line just kept the puck in the Nashville zone. They played about six minutes straight in this second period in the Nashville zone, uh, which was awesome. Uh, a late breakaway by McCarron comes. Uh, it's a Quinn Hughes giveaway, the last man back, a play he really shouldn't have made. Uh, Demko turns it aside, uh, and the final few minutes of this period were all Nashville. Shots were 15-10 to 10 in favor of the Preds. Um, in the second period, but we get to the third period and uh, the Canucks get some special teams luck. Two early power plays and on the second one, it's Brock Besser. A really nice play from JT Miller on the left wing. Fires it. It's a pass, a hard pass along the ice to Brock Besser who just has a stick on the ice. It hits it and goes in. Perfect play all around, giving the Canucks their first lead of the night. Nashville ramping up the pressure. They have a, a puck that goes off of Tucker Pullman's skate and off of the post, staying out of the net. Um, and then it had been a pretty rough game from the, I guess, fourth line, third line, whatever you want to call them, the Mott, Lamico, uh, Dickinson unit, um, where, or Highmore, not Dickinson, um, where they just hadn't played very well. But then Tyler Mott goes in on the four check, plays it out to Lamico, who one hand swings at it and chops it through Riddich, uh, to make it three, one. And the Canucks now have a two goal lead. Uh, Predators get a power play with five and a half to go, looking to get back in it. Tolvanen puts him off the shoulder and then inside of the post stays out. Uh, Riddish goes to the bench. Tyler Mott uh, gets uh, sent by Pedersen on a partial breakaway. Mott bats it, probably a high stick, uh, but bats it out of the air, uh, is going in on a breakaway and gets a stick sloshed out of his hand. So the Canucks go to the power play. That ends the game. And that is basically it. So it's four points on a, out of the five game road trip, which again, doesn't sound that great, but when you consider the teams they were up against and you consider the way they played, uh, I think we would have taken that uh, at the start of the trip. Let's go over my pluses, my minuses for this one, as we always do. We'll start with the pluses because uh, I've got quite a few of them. The first one is just that Elias Patterson line. Elias Patterson, Vasily Podkolzin, Niels Hoaglander, the three of them tonight were 
actually fantastic. Uh, I don't have the analytics side of it. There was one thing that I saw that they had, they were like out chancing the opponent, like 12 to three or something at one point, I'll pull up natural stat trick here in a second. Uh, but basically it was, uh, just a, an excellent, excellent game, uh, from those three where every time they were in the offensive zone, it felt like something could have happened. Uh, let's see expected goals for Elias Pettersson tonight. Uh, 77% of expected goals at five on five. If we go to all situations that goes up to, or does it go up or down or uh, it goes up to 87.73% expected goals while Elias Pettersson was on the ice tonight, uh, which is excellent to see. Um, if we just go back to five on five, because five on five is a little bit more fair. Uh, other numbers that stood out, uh, Niels Hoaglander, 82.52% at five on five, which led the Vancouver Canucks tonight. And shortly behind him, Vasily Podkolzin at 82.07. So the three of them played phenomenally tonight uh, as a unit. Uh, Pedersen, the last three games, I mean, the Tampa game, he looked pretty good. Uh, the Carolina game, again, as a write-off. Uh, but the game against Washington, he gets the two goals and the game tonight. He, uh, he really looked good. I got, there's a little bit of a scare. He sort of was shaking the wrist off at one point, which was a little bit worrying, but, uh, man, the three of them honestly played great. Um, uh, no doubt with Horvat out for a little while here, cause the Canucks are at home. He has to get across the Canadian border, uh, before he'll be allowed to play again. So no doubt we're going to see the three of them stick together. Uh, cause they were really, really good. Um, Tucker Pullman stood out tonight in an offensive capacity. Uh, he just seemed to always be taking shots or always trying to get possession and trying to do stuff. Like there was the one play where Tucker Pullman took it from behind the, the Nashville net, did a little half pivot backhand shot against the grain. And you're like, who is this guy? Uh, he was doing that quite a bit tonight. I actually wonder, can we see, did he, have, how many shots on goal did he have tonight? Uh, only two. It felt like he had like six. I don't know if he attempted more, um, but it, it definitely felt like it. Uh, he was, uh, he was given her that's for sure. Um, Thatcher Demko again. I mean, what can you say? Uh, he stops. What was it? 32 of 33, uh, 31 of 32 close enough. Uh, excellent game from him. The one goal he lets through on Tomasino again, he might've wanted it back. Um, but you only allowed one goal tonight. You gave your team a pretty good chance to win. Uh, that's good enough for me. Uh, and then again, that, uh, that six minutes of dominance in the second period, a big plus, um, and yeah, let's, let's sort of talk about the road trip as a whole and why I think going two and three is, is pretty acceptable. Um, the, the first part about it is, yeah, the Canucks played when they went into this road trip. If you looked at the standings and you sort of buy points, not points percentage, but, but, but points, cause I think Nashville played a couple more games or whatever. Um, they were five of the top six teams in the NHL, uh, in regards to points, which is. Uh, uh, that's a tough road trip, right? You're against Florida who might be one of the best teams in the league right now. And honestly, they gave Florida a pretty good run, right? You look analytically and, and shots wise. I think the shots were like 44, 26 in that game. Uh, the Canucks honestly played really well against Florida. Uh, Dem quite a bad night and they just got beat a bit, right? It happens, uh, but they played really well. They, the game against Tampa, again, they played pretty well. Uh, they lose it by basically a goal. There was an empty netter to make it a two-goal game. But again, I thought they had played pretty well. Uh, the Carolina game, that was kind of a write-off. Um, and the, so the three losses that they had on this trip, two of them, you could have said, hey, they kept up with Florida and Tampa on the road. That's really good. And then the fact is, sure, they didn't get anything out of those games, which sucks, right? But they come back and they get... Uh, two of the easier opponents. And why I say easier, I'm not saying much easier, right? We're talking Washington and Nashville, two of the top teams also in the NHL. And the Canucks, again, were the better team in both of these games. I don't know analytically if they were the better team tonight, actually. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I expected goals, um, all, all, all situations. Uh, expected goals 55% in favor of the Canucks. So yeah. The Canucks analytically were the better team again tonight. Uh, even if the shot counter doesn't show it because the Predators had quite a few more shots, high danger chances were 11 to 10 in favor of the Canucks. Um, so pretty even in that regard and expected goals, the edge goes to Vancouver anyways. And when you have a goalie like that, Jordemko, if you can keep it pretty even, you have a pretty good chance of winning these games, especially when the guys you need to score are scoring like Elias Patterson and Brock Besser and uh, Yuho Lamico, apparently. 
Um, so honestly, in my opinion, the road trip as a whole is a pretty big plus. I think it gives them a really good jumping off point here of they had that stretch, uh, where they won eight in a row against some pretty weak teams, but Hey, they won eight in a row. And then they got their real challenge where they had to go out into these really tough buildings. Well, not necessarily tough buildings, but tough teams. Um, and they, they hung with them at the very least. They hung with a bunch of teams that are going to be in the playoffs this year. And, uh, that's pretty good. And Calgary is still losing games and Edmonton's still losing games. Although I think, I think Calgary is, uh, is winning tonight. They're up three, one on Florida. We'll hope that that turns around, but either way, um, a pretty decent stint for the team on the minus side, special teams. <laughs> How many times do we have to talk about the special teams in these games? Um, the Canucks on this five game road trip only took 12 penalties, which is really good, right? They were only shorthanded 12 times in these five games. They got scored on, on half of those. The Canucks penalty kill went at 50% over the course of this road trip, uh, six for 12, uh, which means the power plays against them also went six for 12. That is not good enough. The power play, you know, scored a goal tonight. That's great. They, they, they scored it, but again, only on five opportunities it took, um, it, the special teams needs to get better because it was what killed them early in the season and brought them down to the level they are at. Uh, and if it continues, then it's going to be a real uphill battle because now you're having to outscore teams, not just in general, but also at five V five. If you want a chance to win these games, if you're giving up a power play goal every night, that's every single game on this road trip. They gave up at least one power play goal. They also gave up a shorty to Florida. Uh, special teams needs to be a lot better, especially on the PK side. Um, the other minuses, uh, the Lamico line, uh, they got worked a bit tonight, but Hey, they survived it. They didn't allow anything against them and they scored a goal. So net plus, I guess, uh, and they got outshot, but that doesn't mean all that much. Um, and also I think Nashville out, like at least in the first period was a lot more physical and they dominated the game physically early, but I think the Canucks brought it back later on and they realized how aggressive Nashville was being physically and pushed back. Uh, to keep things uh, keep things fairly even. Hits were 31 apiece in this game. Uh, another fun stat while I'm looking at NHL.com here, giveaways is one of the things that they've highlighted on this NHL.com uh, tracker thing. The Canucks had four giveaways tonight. Nashville was credited with 19 giveaways. Uh, that's a big story for this game. All right, let's get to your thoughts, uh, your opinions. We'll start off uh, skipping a bit ahead to Rain here with the $5 Super Chat. Thank you very much. Uh, saying big fan. If there's one player I'm willing to be patient with, it's Petey. Hopefully this trend continues. I that's sort of where I've been, where I've been sticking this whole time. Uh, I, again, I, I've always thought, you know, again, it's only been a couple of games, so I don't want to, I don't want people to, be, I don't want Pedersen to have a rough go and people like, ah, told you it was just two good games. Um, Pedersen has enough skill to get through stuff like this, and and if it takes him 20 games, 40 games a year eventually I feel like it was, it's due for him to get over it, whether or not that's now. And it seems like he's getting a bit of that swagger back. Um, you know, three goals in the last two games, uh, eventually some things just click for you. Um, hopefully this is the end of that Pedersen slump. I don't want to get like, knock on wood. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, but, uh, yeah, hopefully this trend does continue. All right. I'm going to scroll up to the top of the comment machine. Uh, Aisha saying four to 10 points with that murderer's row of opponents. I'll take it because PD seems to be back. Uh, I think that's pretty fair. Um, also I asked you guys in a poll here that is currently running that has 150 votes and I'm going to cut it right now. Uh, and I'll wait for it to load. Cause after you hit end poll, it takes a second. Um, come on, come on, load the poll. Uh, I asked basically, what would you grade the road trip? There it is on 152 votes. Uh, 78% of you guys gave it a B. Now I did the same poll question on Canucks after dark last night where we'd graded the first four games and most people were on the C mark. So this is where I fall as well. Uh, again, because the Canucks were a good enough team on four of the five games. Uh, sure. Only four points. Isn't great. Uh, Agam's argument is, well, we didn't win the road trip, so it can't be an A or a B, but I have a C considering who we had to play and still played pretty well. Yeah. And I, again, it, it really depends on how much you weight results, uh, compared to the process, right? Um, we're at a point in the season for the Canucks where results are really, really important 
but results don't come if you don't have the right process. So if they can go out and at least keep it interesting against some of the best teams in the NHL, well, that gives me a lot of hope for when they're against some of these middling teams, right? When they go up against the LAs, the San Jose's, the Edmontons that are struggling right now and Calgary who's struggling right now. Well, the Canucks are a team that looks like they can at least on occasion hang with these big boys and maybe they'll be able to take that uh, momentum into some of these weaker opponents because they do have, you know, some weaker opponents coming up. They think they have Florida next again, which is rough on Friday. So a couple of days off here um, and then they get St. Louis, which is going to be a tough team. But then they get some games that are really, really important. They get Edmonton, they get Winnipeg and they get Calgary, three teams that they basically are going to need to leapfrog if they want to make things interesting for the playoff race. Um, and if they can carry this momentum, maybe win one of those games against Florida and St. Louis, um, and then carry that into that week and, and try to pull off some big wins, uh, within the conference, uh, that could be a good, uh, scenario for sure. Uh, Sion saying we're above the Oilers now. That is, <clears throat> excuse me. That is true. Don't look at the games played column, please. Uh, just look at the points column. Uh, <laughs> Canucks have played four more games than the Oilers, but yeah, the Canucks now have more points. Then the Edmonton Oilers, they are officially in sixth in the Pacific Division because the NHL doesn't track by points, percentage attracts by points, uh, and we take those at this point. Uh, they're also one point back of Winnipeg, again, if you ignore the games played column, but uh, let's go. Um, Casey saying, I hope the Pedersen, Hoagland, and Pocolson line stay together to see what happens. Uh, there's no way they're getting broken up uh, in the next little while here, uh, especially with Horvat out. Um, hopefully Garland can come back into the lineup in a couple of days here. I don't know. Again, don't ask me the whole COVID protocol slash border crossing. Like there's, it's way too complicated for my brain. I'll wait till they tell me who's in the lineup and then we'll say, let's go. Uh, but until then I am, uh, I'm out of the loop. Um, but yeah, I, they're, they're definitely going to keep that line together. I don't think any lines are going to get changed up, uh, on the next game on Friday. Um, Alter saying uh, four to 10 points for the death row trip isn't bad. Uh, Canucks are really competitive in most of those games. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, it was a real possibility that they came out of that trip with zero points, right? I think, I think two months ago, that team mid December or not mid, uh, mid November, that team probably loses all five of these games. Maybe gets like a point, right? Uh, this, th this team is showing that they can keep up with some of the better teams in the NHL. Uh, and stay competitive, which is uh, the most important thing. Uh, Colton, do you think we'll see any moves now that we're finished with this road trip? And this is a really good question because Jim Rutherford had said, this is going to be the real testing grounds for the team, right? He saw the team go on an eight game run where they won a bunch of games. He also saw the team on a terrible 25 game run before that, right? So he's, he's well aware that there's been a real down and a real up and they probably are falling somewhere in the middle. So he wanted a chance to see this team and see how they stacked up to these real competitors. And the Canucks held up pretty well. Uh, they also said, you know, I think Boudreaux said it's sort of like a seven game testing ground because of the Panthers and the Blues on Friday and Sunday. So we'll see how they play in those two. But um, I, I don't think this accelerates anything. I, I think this road trip did enough for the team where things just sort of get pushed down the road. If the Canucks had gone 0 and 5 and they had, you know, or 1 and 4 and they, they just didn't play very well, then I think you might see some selling now just to, or at least not now, but in the next couple of weeks here, just to sort of accelerate that process and maybe get some more value uh, for some of your pieces. If you're trying to move a Tyler Mott or a JT Miller or someone along those lines. Um, but I think the Canucks have sort of earned a little bit more time, right? Trade deadline is not for another two months. It's middle of March. I think it's March 22nd. There's two months left until then, probably like 30 games on the schedule. Um, once those February games are added back in, that's a lot of time for, to get a little bit more clarity on the situation, right? To see where, where will the Canucks be in a month from now, right? They have a couple, a bunch of home games in February, uh, from those games that got postponed. Will they be able to, you know, are they closer to a playoff spot by then and then earn a little bit more leash? Have they sort of fallen off a little bit and are, you know, looking less and less likely to make the playoffs and then they can make those moves um, to, to make those sales uh, at that point. So I think they've probably just bought themselves time, in my opinion. Um, JC Van Dam saying Patterson getting his confidence back. I really missed him. I think we all missed him. 
Uh, let's let's be fair. I haven't saying that Pug Colson is the key to unlocking Pedersen. I love the way Pug Colson plays. I I think the thir- like putting him with two guys like Pud Colson and Hoaglander who are just go 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 all the time. Uh, I think that's really motivating for a player like Pet- Pedersen, right? Because he can bounce off that energy and you know he can try to use it to his advantage. Um, and it seems to be working at the very least. And it has worked earlier in the season, right? A couple, uh, like a few weeks ago, they looked pretty good together. Um, hopefully they can keep that up. Uh, Flaming Storm says decent road trip team played good, but the results could have been better like Tampa and Florida. Fair enough. The team needs to score more goals. Yes, you are fully right. Uh, the team does need to score more goals. Uh, you look at these games, right in these five games, the Canucks scored, uh, 12 goals in five games. That's not good enough, right? And it's the reason that they lost... Okay, they lost the Florida game because, look, Demko had a bad night. That's fair. I mean, they lose the Tampa game because they can't get more than two past Andre Vasilevsky. Um, uh, They lose the Hurricanes game. They get 30-something shots. They only score one goal. Uh, The game against the Capitals, they get four. Tonight, they get three. But, you know, you want to be starting to... You need to see some more from that, right? The Canucks haven't scored more than three goal, Or, I guess, more than four goals in a game uh, in about two and a half weeks now. That game against the Kraken. Uh, and even before that, it's it's a pretty rare occurrence. So you want to see more of these games where your team's scoring four goals, maybe even five, but at least four to get some of that offense going. Uh, and you'd like to see everyone sort of clicking, right? We had a couple of games early in the road trip where only the bottom six was producing. You have these games where really only the top six is producing, and then there's that Lamico one uh, there near the end. So if you can get everyone involved a little bit, uh, then, then hopefully things can sail a little bit uh, smoother at that point. Uh, Cam saying another great game from John Pond, Yuho Lamico. Uh, getting some more games under him seems to be making him better and better. We have a decently solid fourth line. Yeah, lamico has been good. Uh, that fourth that fourth line did struggle tonight at times. They uh, the first two periods, I think they were getting outshot ten to one while they were on the ice, which isn't great. But they didn't break right. They they went with the whole Ben don't break uh, sort of analogy there. Uh, and it worked out. Uh, and again, yeah, I think the defense is is the most worrying thing about the team. And I think the bottom the bottom six seems to be holding its own, especially if they can get guys back. Right, you get Horvat back, you get Garland back, you can push Chase on out of the lineup. Speaking of, how long did Chase on play tonight? Nine thirty eight. Dowling played seven thirty nine. Uh, yeah, they're they're just not getting ice time, uh, and for for fairly good reason. Um, <laughs> um, Alter. Pullman, Burrows, and Hunt. Which one would you keep? Send to the AHL or trade? Um, if you can get anything for... I mean, you need to keep a couple of guys in the lineup. Um, if you can get anything for Tucker Pullman, you take it. Because, I, again, I think that contract has negative value. Uh, another three years at $2.5 million. I just... I, I didn't like it from the start. Um, and if it's not a lot of negative value, if you say that he's a $1.5 million player... Well, you're still wasting a million bucks for the next three years. Uh, so if you can get anything for Pullman, then I think you take it. Uh, Kyle Burrows and Hunt, I mean, I'm fine with keeping them around um, as depth. Uh, but ideally, they don't have to play many games. Um, Fangirl saying, do you think Olveen gets named GM in the next two weeks? I do. I I, I think that's that seems to be the way we're trending uh, for sure. Uh, Shannon says, great win by the Canucks. Petey's looking better and better each game. Hopefully that continues. Um Let's see here. Uh, Agam saying defense looks a bit slow. I uh, wonder when uh, Boudreaux calls up Rathbone. Yeah, you mentioned that he likes puck moving defensemen, but every single NHL coach also likes guys who aren't that risky deeper in the depth chart, right? Um, the problem is they are slow. Uh, Quinn Hughes is the only one that can skate back there, really. Um, you know, guys like Pullman, Pullman's slow. Brad Hunt is is pretty slow. Ekman Larson's pretty slow. Um, they can get beat wide and we saw it in the, the Carolina game. I think it was that where Aho just sort of walked them and scored. Um, or maybe that was, was that Barkov in Florida? I don't know. There's so many good players. Um, I would like to see Rathman in the lineup though. I don't think anything gets changed though in the lineup, uh, after this game. Um, Blitz saying, maybe I'm just nitpicking, but for the amount of offensive zone time we had, I think we could have more shots. Uh, yeah, they didn't take a lot of shots. They only had 24 shots. Um, but like I said, you look at some of the other stats, um, shot attempts, predators led 58 to 52. Um, but the big thing that, that stood out to me was high danger chances. Even with eight fewer shots, the Canucks had more high danger chances, at least according to natural stat trick, 11 to 10. Um, 
and it did seem like the Canucks had a lot of really good offensive zone time. And especially I, I look back at that six minute period in the second when they basically held the puck in the Nashville zone for that entire six minutes, they only had a couple of shots during that time, right? I was watching the shot counter. I was like, oh, Nashville still has more shots than the Canucks at this point. Uh, I was surprised it hadn't ticked up because uh, they weren't really taking a lot of shots, but they were more so just dominating possession, uh, which is good, but you can't put pucks in the net if you don't put pucks on the net, as Wayne Gretzky once said, uh, exactly like that. Um, let's see here. Um... Where are we at? Uh, I'm going to just find some of the longer ones here because we've been going for a little bit already. Um, Kai saying, it's great to see Petey score again, but I'm much more relieved to see him moving his feet and playing a lot stronger on the puck. He's a much more dangerous player when he's consistently moving. Um, yeah, and there's also some of just the confident moves that he makes, right? Um, you know, where uh, he just goes through a guy's legs just because he can. Uh, he had really good work on the boards tonight, I thought, especially on the power play. Um, whenever he did get into a board battle, he usually won it and got it back to Hughes at the point. Um, he did seem stronger on the puck. I think that's totally fair. Uh, he wasn't falling all over the place. Like he was in Carolina. Um, I, uh, I genuinely think it wasn't, it's not just that he scored two goals. He has genuinely looked pretty good these last couple of games. Um, Lauren saying, has the NHL posted the updated schedule? What's the next month looking like in regards to easier or harder opponents? I don't think they posted the schedule yet. Uh, if we look at the next, I mean, we only know the games for the next, you know, two weeks or so before the Olympic break. Uh, they basically have the Panthers, the Blues, the Oilers, the Jets, the Flames, the Blackhawks, the Predators. So seven games left before the Olympic break. The Canucks will have a few games during that. Uh, basically, they have the Panthers and Blues, which are both going to be tough teams. You know, we just saw the Panthers. Uh, hopefully Demko is, is more on his game that night, which I, I have no doubt he will be. Uh, and I think they can make that one pretty interesting. I think they can make the Blues game pretty interesting. And then the, the next three games are the big ones, right? Uh, in division, the Oilers, in conference, the Jets going for those wild card spots. And then the Flames, they get the Blackhawks, who should be a, a pretty doable win because they're not very good. And then they get the Predators again, who they just faced tonight on February 1st. So about two weeks from uh, exactly two weeks from today. Uh, back on the road. And then those Olympic break games, I don't remember what they are. There's a Sens game in there. There's a Maple Leafs game in there. That's kind of it. Um, Molly asking, off topic, can we do a marble game on another stream? Uh, we might do a watch along uh, someday again, and then we'll do it on those intermissions. Uh, we will see though. Um, let's see here. Um, Raro saying, have we underestimated our fourth line this year? I think so. I think they have overachieved and you look at the names, right? Tyler Mott. We knew what Tyler Mott was and I think he's lived up to that and that's fine. Um, but we look at Yuho Lamico, total unknown, got in the Yuho Levy trade, uh, didn't have much cachet, uh, seemed fine, but not like great. Uh, but he's been pretty solid. Uh, and then you look at Matthew Highmore who they picked up in the Godet trade. Uh, again, not flashy, but he's been, totally serviceable. Uh, I think they were underestimated because they were unknowns, right? We didn't know what Highmore was. Uh, we didn't know what Lamico was. Um, and they've both exceeded our expectations, which is great. Uh, debut saying, uh, likes all around. We're streaking again, baby. Yeah. Two in a row, technically a streak. That is true. Uh, yeah. Hit the like button if you haven't already. Um, we have Scout Zhao saying if uh, Pedersen, Hoaglander, and Podkolzin can consistently play like top uh, competitive top six for the remainder of the season, uh, I think Brock Besser would be let go in free agency. Uh, he won't get let go in free agency. They're going to qualify him. They're going to sign him. Um, and I think I, I think it's more likely that that Miller gets traded than it, it, and they don't have to re-sign Miller until the year after, anyways. Um, so I I don't uh, I don't think they're going to let go of Brock Besser in any world. Um, if anything, they trade them and get some value, um, from it. Um, KT saying, I think Garland's stuck longer than Bo because he's not a Canadian citizen. Is he not? Is Connor Garland American? Connor Garland. You guys see how, yeah, he is American. Maybe that is true. Yeah. That's, it is, it is a tricky scenario. I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to try to get into it. Uh, Grind saying only watched the third period was Pedersen good the whole entire game. Yeah, 
yeah, he genuinely that that line was just on one tonight. They were uh, they were excellent. Um, RC saying lots of rumors about JT going to the Rangers. Um, last night in Canucks after dark, Clay and I talked about that for about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, so there's the link to that in the description somewhere. If you want to listen to that after, uh, or on your favorite podcast platform, uh, Canucks after dark, uh, where we discussed that at length, probably around the 40 minute mark of that podcast. So, uh, we definitely go into a lot of detail there. Uh, Gerjot saying, what are your thoughts on every team sending a player for all-star? Um, I think it's a little cheesy, especially when there's only like 10 players on each team and there's only eight teams in each division, right? Only like one or two teams can have an extra guy go, um, which kind of is lame, but also it's a, it's meant for money and it's really meant for the kids, right? Uh, if you're a fan of a team, you want to see one of your players there. Um, and I'm kind of okay with that, right? Uh, it was nice for us to see Besser there and Pedersen there and, um, you know, Demko's going this year, which will be good. And I, I, I'm i honestly, it's not that important, right? You like the recognition to be like, oh, this guy was an NHL all-star that year. But that doesn't do much, right? It might make their contract negotiations a little better for them. Um, I think they'll enjoy their vacation time, though. Uh, I, I genuinely, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me all that much. Uh, the Elder saying, Flames are softening up the Panthers for us tonight. Well, we play the Flames soon, too, so... Hopefully they don't get too much momentum from it. Flames are up 4-1 at this point with 16 to play. Uh, that game looks basically over. Uh, is Bobrovsky in net there? Uh, Florida. No, they have Spencer Knight in. Uh, so you have to wonder if it's just goaltending that's been part of the problem here. Um, and if uh, if we'll see Bobrovsky, uh, who gave the Canucks a lot of trouble uh, on Friday. Uh, Lauren wants to talk about the, uh, the Oilers a little bit. I know you hate about, uh, I know you hate betting against Duke McDavid and Dreisaitl. Do you think they're close to bring the slump or do you think this is long-term now? Um, yeah, I, I struggle betting against them, but they are the only two players on that team really, right? Uh, they're the only players contributing, uh, that, that whole Dreisaitl drama and, uh, what's his name? Um, oh man, I don't remember his name. The reporter, um, the hall of fame reporter who called him pissy, <laughs> which was actually hilarious. Um, look, I, I have trouble betting against them because I know they can just win games at will. The problem is they don't have goalies and they don't have defense. So the other teams can also score at will. So it's basically just a race back and forth on who can score more goals. Um, and the other team has more players that can score than the Oilers do. That's what causes, that's what costs them game. I, I can't speak English. Um, but again, I, I still, I watch Connor McDavid play and I wonder why doesn't he score four goals a night? Cause he genuinely looks like he scores whenever he wants to. Um, so I think they, I, I don't think they are this bad. I, they were really hot to start the season. They're really bad right now. They probably fall somewhere in the middle. It's similar with the Canucks, right? The Canucks were really bad. Now they're playing pretty well. And the reality is probably somewhere in the middle, right? Everything sort of regresses back to the mean. And I think that will probably happen with the Oilers. They just need it to happen soon because they are falling and falling and falling. And if you're a Canucks fan, it's pretty fun to see. Um, what else do we got here? Uh, we'll take a couple more. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Aoun. Uh, I have to say living out East here in Toronto, the, my Canucks are impressing the NHL media here and earning mad respect. That is good to hear because trust me, we hear about the Maple Leafs out West all the time. Uh, so it is, uh, it is nice that we get uh, a little bit of recognition. I think it's well-deserved. Um, you know, the Canucks are playing pretty good hockey, uh, right now. And, and if they can keep it up, they, uh, they might make things interesting. Hopefully, uh, Dustin, what do you think the Canucks biggest weakness is, or the area that needs to be improved most by the new GM? Um, it's the defense. Uh, and there's so many facets to it. One is that entire right side is just kind of a mess. Um, Quinn Hughes needs a partner. Quinn Hughes needs a good partner, right? You can put him with Luke Shen all day long. Um, but that means that Luke Shen is playing 20 minutes a night or whatever it ends up being, which isn't great. Um, he needs a consistent top four defensemen next to him. Uh, and they just need more better defensemen, right? Uh, Hughes is great. Ekman Larson has been pretty good, probably still a bit overpaid, but he's been pretty good. Tyler Myers has been surprisingly good this year. But then you look at guys like Pullman and Hunt, and I mean, Burroughs has been better than expected, but it's still Kyle Burroughs. Um, things really fall apart really quickly. 
um, you know, Luke Shen uh, to sort of add to that. So the Canucks need uh, defense it is really the biggest thing here. Uh, Agam saying we've been so good at five under five, five on five under Bruce. Imagine where we'd be if we had a semi-decent penalty kill. Yeah, I mean the Canucks have a, are averaging one penalty kill goal against per game. I think they've allowed thirty-seven goals in thirty-nine games while shorthanded. Um, and if we're talking about a team that's clicking at eighty percent instead of like sixty-seven, well, that's maybe like 10, 12 less goals. That's enough to maybe flip four or five games this season, right? And we're talking about a team that's way more in the mix. Um, the penalty killing is ruining them and it's probably down to what, like 67% at this point, uh, which is just absolutely not good enough. Uh, and if that doesn't get fixed, then the rest of the, the rest of the, the rest of their games don't matter. Right. Uh, the Canucks have been lucky cause they haven't taken a lot of penalties, right? We talk about this road trip where they only took 12 penalties. They still allowed over a goal per game over those five games. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, Ivan saying Hoaglander's 21, Puck Olsen's 20, Patterson's 23. These guys aren't even close to their prime yet. I kind of disagree. Um, lots of stuff lately has shown that primes are a lot earlier than people once used to say. People used to say like 27, 28, and then defensemen were around like 29. Uh, lots of the curves now that we see, um, that come up that I just see prop up all the time. He's around 23, 24 is, is around that peak. And then it slowly declines. Obviously there's, there's exceptions, right? There's, Alex Ovechkin, who just does this. There's Brad Marchand, who hit 30 and basically went on a skyrocket up. That can happen. Nathan McKinnon wasn't really great until he was like 22, 23 years old. And then he skyrocketed up. Um, but for most players, for average players, usually the peak is around the 23, 24-year-old mark at this point, it seems to be. Uh, but yeah, Hoaglander and Puggles and still have a, a couple years to get there. Of course, they're, they're very new to the league uh, in their first and second years. Um, and if Pet and, and usually those elite players tend to prolong that prime. Uh, so Patterson ideally should be able to push that out uh, a little bit longer. Uh, Le uh, Lennon saying when Horvat's 5.5 million is up, what is he worth? Uh, quite a bit, right? He is a really, he is a high end second line center who can win a lot of faceoffs. He can kill penalties. I mean, no one can kill penalties on this team. Uh, he can score goals. He he's pretty skilled. He he's a leader. He's a captain. Uh, I feel like he's got a lot of value to him, right? Um, you know, wh whether we're talking seven and a half, eight, that feels like a lot. Um, but we're, we're talking about not next year, like the end of next season, the cap will have gone up a bit. Uh, I could see him asking for a fair amount of money, a fair amount of a raise there. Uh, Shiraz saying Canucks after dark is the best. You're correct. Uh, thank you. Uh, Agam saying that Bo's around six and a half to eight. Yeah, that's a very wide range. Uh, I think probably somewhere in the seven to five, seven, five range is, is pretty accurate. Um, uh, Florida or BL tubes with a good call out saying that Florida plays the Oilers the night before the Canucks, the Canucks getting another back to back opponent. Hey, that'll be three in a row for the Vancouver Canucks then. Uh, yeah, they play in Edmonton on the Thursday. So yeah, you have to imagine it probably is going to be Bobrovsky in that one. And then night, the following night. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully that's the case. Uh, and hopefully they don't go the other way. That's perfect scenario is ideally, um, Sergey Bobrovsky just shuts out the Oilers and then Spencer Knight is an absolute disaster, uh, against the Canucks man. The Panthers are, I can't believe it. you look at the last three Panthers games before this one, they scored nine, seven and five goals <laughs> tonight. They've only scored one on Calgary, but that's crazy. Uh, see on it. We trade Hamannick or something. He's injured. He's hurt. There's no, uh, I don't have any info on it. Uh, Agam is Furland's money still on the books. Yeah. Uh, Michael Furland. I don't know. How long is that for? Is that, is this year the last year of that, uh, he's on LTI that's this year and next year, but he's fully on LTI. Um, you know, he, he's not, he's not going to play another game, but it just means that the Canucks don't have any, any cap space. You know, they can't be under the cap, right? They basically have to, LTI only counts for whatever the amount over the cap you go. Um, so it's kind of, it hurts flexibility, but technically he's still on the cap. Um, yes. Uh, why is this something pointing out that last five periods Demko's allowed zero even strength goals? That's pretty impressive. I like that. 
Uh, RP88 saying, which Canuck do you think has been the unsung hero for our last two games? Well, everyone's gone Pedersen uh, as like the actual hero. Unsung? I don't know. That's tricky. Um, I, I mean, I, it's hard to say Quinn Hughes is unsung, uh, but just watching him tonight, I mean, he had a couple of bad plays, right? He had that giveaway that led to a breakaway against, but watching him skate is so silly. There was one play where he just skated, you know, like someone came in on the four check on him and he just spun away and had seven feet of separation going the other way up the ice. And it's so fun to watch one play in the offensive zone. He rushes and makes a pass, gets so far away from everyone else and receives another one. Um, I, I just love, I just love Quinn Hughes. Uh, Brad Clarkson saying Demko's a steal at his contract already. Yeah. Five years, $5 million a year. And he's playing like he's worth eight. Um, he's so, so, so good. Uh, fun Q saying, how come you and Clay don't do the post game shows collaboratively? Uh, we both have our own stuff going on. He goes to more games. This is a, my, this is sort of my own thing. Um, we do our weekly thing once a week. Uh, but this is my thing. We, uh, we're, we're still separate entities. Um, and this is, this is my space. Um, time for Aki making some JT Miller trade proposals, Schneider, Heedle, and a first round pick. I don't know anything about Schneider. Uh, I honestly don't know anything about any Rangers players. Really. I know Heedle has a sick name. Um, and I would, I think Miller really has a lot of trade value. Um, Nathaniel, I missed the game, but who do you say the three stars for the Canucks? Uh, I mean, it's, it's Patterson, Pod Colson, and Hoaglander, uh, and Demko. <laughs> that Pedersen line was fantastic tonight. Uh, and I think all three of them deserve a star, uh, for that. But I mean, you, you gotta give, I mean, Thatcher Demko is excellent as he usually is. Um, and with that, I think we're going to wrap up this one for tonight. Thank you to the, you know, 160 something people in here. Uh, if you enjoyed the stream, hit like, if you missed any part of it, you can rewind back to the beginning for the recap and the plus minus section, which is my thoughts on the game around the six, seven minute mark. Feel free to rewind to that, or you can find it on your favorite podcast platform in about 25, 30 minutes. Just search Parker's pucks or it's linked in the description. Uh, shout out to our members. As always, I appreciate you all. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, there's a little join button down below there. Completely optional, uh, but make sure you're subscribed because we do this after every Canucks game. I'll be back here Friday night after the Canucks hopefully beat the Panthers. Uh, it'll be probably a 945 start because it's a late game, 7 p.m. Pacific. Uh, so I will see you guys then. Have a good one and I'll talk to you next time.